I think that we are live now and I have to apologize to everyone. We had a little bit of a technical glitch for the first time ever on our Blue Coat Talks, but I think we're live and we're ready to go. So thank you for being patient and uh, spending your lunch hour with us. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our next Blue Coat Talk. My name is Julie Muscolic and I have the pleasure of being the Science Director at Science North and Dynamic Earth in Sudbury. And today I am just so thrilled to be able to play the role of host uh, with one of our science champions that I think is one of my most favorite people. Dr. Scott Sampson is a fellow Canadian, but he currently lives in San Francisco, where he is the executive director of the California Academy of Sciences, which I have to tell you is one of my most favorite places to go and visit. It's an, it's an incredible facility. Some of you may already know Dr. Scott. Uh, he has a very cool and interesting background. Uh, he's a Canadian paleontologist, so he's a dinosaur person. You might remember him as the host of PBS Kids Dinosaur Train Show. Lots of us have watched that show. And he is the author of, I think, one of my favorite books of all time, How to Raise a Wild Child. Most of all, though, like I said at the beginning, uh, Scott is a science champion. And today we're going to spend some time with Scott, getting to know the things that got him excited about nature, the cool things that he's been up to. But most of all, because we have this great audience with us today, we would really love for you to engage with us, with Scott and I. Ask us any questions, just put them into the chat box, and uh, I will make sure to bring them forward and Scott especially you have his ear you have a, a famous paleontologist and nature lover at your fingertips we're going to spend about half an hour together so the floor is going to be wide open while Scott and I have a great conversation so welcome Scott we're really happy to have you here today thank you Julie it is a real pleasure so I have to start from the beginning because I know that most people are kind of like what he's a paleontologist dinosaurs dinosaur train uh, Scott, you have to talk to us a little bit about dinosaurs. How did you become a paleontologist and the dinosaur guy? Well, like the vast majority of kids, it seems, I was one of those youngsters, four-year-olds that love dinosaurs. Um, without exaggeration, paleontology is one of the first words I learned how to spell. There was a brief time in my life where I could reliably spell the word paleontology and not my last name. Um, and the difference between me and most other kids is that I never grew up. I st continued my love of dinosaurs, whereas most people go on to more adult things, I guess. I continued that. And then when I found out that I could actually have a career um, studying dinosaurs and traveling around the world and digging them up and naming them and all of that, I thought, I'm going to go for that. And so that was the path I took. That's a really interesting path, but I mentioned at the beginning that you've your path has gone down many, many different routes and uh, became influenced by many other things. So today I'm hoping that we can talk to you about not just dinosaurs and, you know, if our audience has questions about dinosaurs, that's great, but especially about falling in love with nature and the power of nature in our everyday lives. And I think maybe, maybe a new, maybe a couple of new words for our audience. Um, and I, I learned them from you, Scott. So one of them is rewilding and the other one is regeneration. So tell me a little bit about, you know, your love for nature and kind of that, that next path that you took. Yeah, well, around that same age, at four years old, my mother really introduced me to the natural world. And actually, that's not true. I started, my mother tells me I was in the womb when we started camping. So that was part of my life. My first memory is my mother taking me to a pond in the woods. I wrote about it in, in that book and experiencing for the first time the picking up tadpoles and walking into the pond until the water was up to my chest and my mother let me do this, thank goodness, because um, it was one of the most powerful experiences of my life. It was the first time, my first memory, but also one of the only times that I've ever experienced that sense of being completely at one with the place around me, that there's no difference between me and my environment. And it was, it was kind of life-changing for me, and that helped set me on the course, and I've always loved nature my whole life ever since. So your mom was very much one of your first nature mentors is what I'm hearing. Yeah, I'm she curious. was. 
she was my my biggest nature mentor by far. I mean, I was nine years old and she had me signed up with a local mountaineering club and doing weekly hikes and all kinds of stuff. So yeah, it was, I give her full credit. So Scott, what advice do you have for our audience about um, how they can become nature mentors? I have a feeling that we probably have some parents with us, might have some aunts and uncles, big brothers, big sisters. How do you, how do you become a nature mentor? Well, I would argue that nature mentoring is one of the most important roles that any adult can take. That um, right now, kids are truly disconnected from nature. The kind of upbringing that I had, this free range childhood, just doesn't really happen anymore. And so kids are disconnected and it's hurting kids seriously. And it's threatening the, the places they live because who's gonna take care of those places if people don't care about them. And so being a nature mentor really just involves having an interest in nature and sharing that with kids. It does not involve being an expert in nature. In fact, you don't need to know anything about the natural world. Turns out that questions are far more powerful than answers. And if a kid asks you a question you don't know the answer to, just say, well, what do you think? And then become like this co-discoverer, co-explorer, um, where you go and find the answers together. And I think doing that for kids is one of the greatest and most important gifts that we can give them. Hey, Scott, I think that everybody around the table here knows that uh, it's been an interesting three months with the impacts of COVID-19 on all of us. You know, we've been sheltering at home, we've been social distancing, and for the viewers that are in Canada, it's, uh, it was a bit of a long end to the winter, let me tell you. So we're all really happy that, you know, it's summer now and, you know, we can go back outside. So tell us a little bit about your thoughts or your thinking on the power of nature as we heal through this COVID period. And as Canadians, we get to go you know, outside and enjoy our nature. Wow, yeah, it's a great question. And a lot of people don't realize the power of nature. My guess is that people in Sudbury realize it more than, more than most just because you have so much nature close by. But nature makes us feel better emotionally. It helps us with our physical well-being. It reduces blood pressure and heart rate and muscle tension and stress hormones, it, you know, it's critical for kids to develop their physical balance and their skills around risk-taking. Um, we need nature in our lives. And what we're, we've, there's been this huge indoor migration so that today the average kid in North America spends about seven to 10 hours a day looking at screens and closer to seven minutes a day outside in nature, which is the reverse of the kind of childhood certainly that I had. And so this is hurting kids. We're seeing runaway rates of obesity, attention deficit disorder, diabetes, type two diabetes, depression, even myopia to the point where one US Surgeon General said a few years ago that this generation of kids could be the first to have a life expectancy shorter than their parents. And so being out in nature, helps us physically, it helps us emotionally. If you've got a kid with attention deficit issues, being out in nature helps that tremendously. The studies show this. So um, nature play turns out to be way more engaging than playing on plastic and metal playgrounds and things like that. So really we all need nature and nature needs us as well. So you know what, Scott, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna remind our audience, make sure you put your questions in our chat because I'm gonna start to bring these questions forward to Scott, give him a little break from talking there, but then um, ask any questions that you have. Um, so Scott, on that note um, about, you know, the, the balance of technology and nature, you know, we, we know that technology is part of our everyday lives. Give us some ideas of, maybe some ways that there can be a blend between the two. And I'll tell you where I'm going with this because I know our audiences at Science North know about this and we engage them in our citizen science projects. There's some really awesome apps that you can use. So you're using technology, but you're out in nature and you're doing some cool stuff. So tell us about that a little bit. Yeah, it's really important. What I am not arguing is that we should have some kind of back to nature movement and give up technology. I think we need to move into a future that is both high tech and nature rich. And as my friend Richard Louvre likes to say, the more high tech our lives become, the more nature we need. 
So it's a matter of balancing technology and nature and actually letting the two enhance each other. To, so to your point, Julie, um, there are apps out there like iNaturalist that allows you to go and photograph any animal or any plant and figure out what it is and share that data with scientists so that they can use it to record, for example, migration patterns or the timing of budding in plants and things like that. There's another app that's just for kids called Seek, S-E-E-K. And you can point it at any plant or animal and it'll just tell you what that thing is. Um, geocaching turns out to be a great thing. If you can get out into nature and geocache, now you're out there using technology and you're on a treasure hunt, for goodness sake. So I think that there's lots of technologies we can use that can help us. And the other thing is sometimes it's good to leave the technology behind because you can open up your senses and experience nature, but you can also keep track of things that once you go back home, you can then look up using technology to help you understand even more. That's great. So I have uh, a question that's been asked here and it's, it's referencing the fact that you're Canadian, uh, but recognizing that you're living in the US. So knowing our environment across Canada, but especially in Ontario, as a Canadian, what would be your top three things to do this coming summer with kids that are five and seven years of age? Well, that would depend on what you do, de totally depends on where you are. Um, and it actually depends on the kids. So one of the things that I like to tell parents is watch your kids and see what they're interested in and then give them more of that. That we need to find out the things that kids are fascinated by. So it could be going hiking or it could be going boating or fishing or whatever it might be, you know, gardening. Look for what the kids are interested in and then give them more and, and allow them to push that. So too often parents go, well, I'm gonna take my kid to the top of this hill and we're gonna go on this five hour hike. And for first of all, never use the word hike with a child. Always call it an adventure. Second of all, don't try and keep them moving on your schedule just because you want to get to the top of some hill doesn't mean your kid does. So slow it down and let them explore what they want to explore. And if they show an interest in bugs or rocks or trees or clouds, feed on that and uh, let them do what they want to do. It makes me think of that that word that we we mentioned at the beginning, the, the rewilding word. Can you Tell us about that, because what you're describing feels like that that might be you know, running wild or rewilding out there. Well, it turns out that we have effectively dewilded the world, that um, the vast majority, if you like, just take the weight of all mammals on Earth today, over 95% of it is humans and our livestock. Only 5% of all um, mammals um, the biomass of mammals on earth today are wild mammals. So we've completely changed the world. And what we need to do is add more of that wildness, whether it's in cities by planting native plants, which attract native insects, which attract native birds, or out in wilderness areas where sometimes we need to think about adding back wolves and grizzlies and bobcats and things like that. So rewilding is this way of looking at the world where we say, let's not um, just get by with the world the way it is. We've degenerated a lot of these places. Let's bring them back and make them better. And the last thing about rewilding is that it's about human rewilding. We've also domesticated ourselves and we need to rewild humans by getting out and connecting with the natural world, seeing the natural world not as a bunch of resources to be exploited, but a bunch of relatives worthy of our respect. Wow, those are powerful words. I have a question from the audience though, and I can tell that this person is from Sudbury because um, they said, you know, on, on the note of, you know, putting things back to the way they were, um, in Sudbury, the, the re-greening movement that rewilded Sudbury has been really powerful. What do you think we need to do as, you know, as parents and as teachers to build a picture of what that could look like for our kids in other places? I think, I hope you I'm mean, capturing that question right. You mean outside of Sudbury? 
Yeah, I think that that's what it is. I mean, referencing Sudbury, the rewilding of Sudbury, but then how do we get how do we get that to go beyond Sudbury and yeah. maybe even bigger? Yeah, I think first of all, it is an amazing story, the regreening of Sudbury. I mean, 40 years ago, you look at what Sudbury was versus today, it's a now a global exemplar, right, of of how to do this. And I think now it's the matter of saying, let's get the community together and think about what the vision is for, let's say 2050, 30 years from now, one generation. What do we want Sudbury to be? What kinds of plants and animals do we want here? What do we want the feel of Sudbury to be? And if you can source the community and get a sense of that vision, now you can start building towards it. And that goes for not only the middle of Sudbury, but outside. And it, of course, you can use this same um, approach anywhere. So whether, you're in the middle of a city or in a rural area or close to wilderness, you can think about how to make that place better over generations. And one of the biggest problems, of course, is an inequality or an inequity around green spaces that we tend to not have green spaces closer to low income communities, whereas people in more affluent communities have lots of it. And we need to think very serious about seriously about accessibility and equity and diversity in these places as well. And make sure that all kids, regardless of their skin color or family income or cultural background, get access to these really inspiring green spaces. Well, that's a, that's a very good point to make about making sure that we have equity and access and, and, uh, and um, places for people to go no matter where they are. I mean, we, you're right, we are very lucky in, in Northern Ontario, especially, but we have lots of urban settings in Ontario as well. Um, okay, so Scott, I have a I have a dinosaur question. I had I had a feeling this was going to come up, so I'm going to divert from nature and go back to your roots as as a little boy. So this person said that they were they were they're big fans of Dinosaur Train. That this was a big part of uh, getting their kids passionate about dinosaurs. So they want to know what your favorite dinosaur dig was that you were on. My favorite dinosaur dig um, happened on the island of Madagascar, um, where I spent a number of seasons working. And we knew that there was a big meat-eating dinosaur there because we had found hundreds of teeth. In fact, they'd been found for a century, but nobody had ever found the animal. And I was fortunate enough to be the human to find a skeleton of this beast, which is now known as Majungasaurus. Um, and uh, it turned out it had close relatives in India, and South America, and it helped us understand the breakup of the Southern continent. So that was my favorite dig. My favorite dinosaur is a beast that I had the pleasure of naming. Um, most people have heard of Triceratops, uh, animal with three horns, one on the nose, one over each eye. My favorite dinosaur is a relative called Cosmoceratops, whereas Triceratops has three horns on its head, Cosmoceratops has 15 horns on its head, blows it away. Um, absolutely marvelous and wonderful and bizarre looking. And that's by far my favorite. Oh, that's a great story. There's nothing like uh, like being out on a dig and uh, never mind being able to name a dinosaur. That's, uh, that's some pretty incredible stuff. Okay, I have uh, another question here and I don't know the answer to this because I'm, I'm an entomologist, so bugs are my thing. Uh, the question is, Triceratops are Canadians, right? What is your favorite Canadian dinosaur? Ooh, there's a great question. And I've done work in Canada. Turns out Triceratops um, was Canadian and American. It did not recognize the border um, and crossed over and was found um, both sides at, right at the very end of the age of dinosaurs around 67, 66 million years ago. My favorite Canadian dinosaur, it would probably be another horn dinosaur, also weird and wacky called Styracosaurus, only known from Alberta. In fact, it's the only place in the world it's ever been found. And it has big spikes coming off the back of its skull um, and is an incredible creature as well. That's fabulous. Okay, so Scott, you'll be happy. We're, we're going to go back to nature here because we have a question from Satu who is age seven. And Satu is asking, how can kids help to protect nature on their own? Ooh, Satu, that's a great question. I think, first of all, you have to learn about your local place. What's there and what does it need? Um, but I think the simplest thing to do is figure out 
what the native plants are that are supposed to be there. And you can usually there's native plant nurseries and things like that you can go to get seeds and plant them. And just by planting those native plants, you will then bring back the insects that like to live on those plants and actually evolved to live on those plants over many thousands and thousands of years. And once those insects come back, well, all those songbirds that eat the insects, they wanna come back as well. So something as simple as planting seeds can help to rewild the place that you live. That's a fabulous answer, Scott. Satchu, I think, I think that that was a great answer and I hope that uh, you can see how there's, there's all these little things that you can do, just small actions that one by one build on each other and get bigger and bigger and bigger until they have a huge ecosystem impact. So that's always been you know, the, the kind of exciting things that I like to do with young people as well is things that everybody can do and planting seeds is, is something that we can all do. So that was a great answer. So Scott, on that, tell me a little bit more about this concept of regeneration. I know, I know that you're writing a new book, so that's exciting. I'm gonna have a new book to read uh, soon. And uh, this is maybe, it might be a question for the older um, members of our audience, but I'm interested in hearing what the answers were. You asked a question on Twitter a while back to help inform your book. And it was, how can humanity transform from a negative degenerative force on earth to a positive regenerative, regenerative force? What answers did you get? Oh, people help you out? Yeah, it's, there's been some interesting answers. So I think part of the problem is this idea of sustainability. I mean, let's, let's be realistic. Sustainability is not very aspirational. Who wants to have a sustainable marriage, right? Come on, honey, let's, let's get sustainable. Wouldn't you rather have a thriving or flourishing marriage, right? So why aren't we looking for a future like that? The problem with sustainability is that it's, it assumes that people are bad for the planet. And the very best you can do is reduce your negative impacts. You can put in compact fluorescent bulbs or recycle or whatever. And the notion of regeneration turns that on its head and says, well, what if humans could actually be good for the planet? What if we could actually make our places better generation over generation? And for example, by planting native plants or whatever it might be, now, we're actually helping the world improve over time. And I'm really excited about this idea. And rewilding is part of this regenerative way of looking at the world. It's about making things better during our lifetimes. And I think that that should be an aspirational goal for all of us. Sure, it's an aspirational goal. Okay, we have a question. I think you triggered one when you were telling this story about uh, regeneration. And the question is, do you think that by living through this pandemic, we will learn the importance of preserving and regenerating nature? Wow, that's a great question. Uh, certainly the, the pandemic um, is directly related to our broken relationship with nature. It was caused by going into wild nature with roads, which then people got, went in and they hunted animals for bush meat and they brought those animals out and they carried viruses that normally would never encounter humans and they jumped to human beings and then ultimately spread all over the world. So if we conserve nature and leave it intact, we will decrease the number of viruses that we have to deal with, things like coronaviruses. So I think whether or not we learn from it, we absolutely should. This is a moment where we have to realize that we've been mistreating the natural world. Whether you're talking about species extinctions or COVID-19 or climate change, they all reflect the fact that we, we kind of treat nature as a Walmart. We just go and get stuff and then we move on and we don't worry about the impacts we have. And we can't do that. Every sip of water, bite of food, breath of air, it all comes from nature. We depend on the natural world and we have to take care of it as a result. Yeah, well, that's great. Thank you for answering that question. We're, we're getting a whole bunch of questions coming in here. So I'm trying to figure out how to like fit them together. We've probably got, I'm thinking five minutes or so left together, if that's okay, Scott. Um, so I'm going to ask you a couple questions, but I want to make sure that, you know, if there's anything else that you wanted to get out to our audience as we're inspired to, you know, 
rewild and go back into nature that you can make sure you you get that out so here's the question and it goes back to the answer that you, you were just talking about now it's a tricky question aren't we too far developed uh in the world that we live in to go back to the wild yeah that's a great question wow. and i would I would argue that the answer is no, but I'm not talking about going back to the wild. I'm talking about adding more wild into the world. We have dewilded the world, but there's no reason that we can't add back that wildness and have our civilization with thriving economies and all of that and have enough for the wild. That right now, humans are one of about 10 to 15 million species on the planet. Why should we take the vast majority of all the resources out there and hammer the rest of nature? Part of this is just coming to think differently about the world, to actually value nature on its own, completely aside for what it does for humans. And if we do that, we will start to treat it differently. And it turns out we absolutely have to do this because if we don't, we're gonna see these cascading extinctions and ultimately threaten human civilization. So this return to wildness is critical, not just for nature, but for humans as well. Oh, that's great. Okay, I'm gonna ask you one last question. I think this one is from a teacher. We might have some teachers that are on their lunch break that are watching this episode of Blue Coat Talks. So this teacher is saying, you know, we try to wrap as many nature-based activities in our school curriculum as we can, what other ideas that you have or do you have to bring kids into nature as part of their daytime school experience? I think this is the Canadian context as well. Yeah, so I, I would say uh, the most important thing you could do is transform the schoolyard into an ecosystem. Not all of it, but some of it. And get comfortable using that schoolyard any time of year. As they say in places like Scandinavia, there's no such thing as bad weather, only bad clothing, right? So it doesn't matter what time of year it is, if you can create vegetable gardens and native plant areas and for elementary schools, nature play areas, outdoor classrooms where you're teaching not just science, but art and history and whatever topic, if you're using that schoolyard, you will be connecting kids with nature. And the wilder it is, the better it will be for the kids, the, the deeper their connection with nature, and the better their learning will be. It turns out that kids tend to relax more in that kind of setting and are better able to learn as well. That's a great answer. I can totally see what that schoolyard would look like. Okay, Scott, we're back to dinosaurs. I knew we would be because we've got the dinosaur king with us today. So we have a question from Emmett, who is four years old. And Emmett wants to know, what is the largest dinosaur in the world? Wow, Emmett, that turns out that that's a harder question to answer than you might think. Because we have, for these giant dinosaurs, the biggest ones are all the long necks. Um, what we call sauropods, what we used to call brontosaurs. Um, and all of them fall into that category. But the biggest one is hard to know because we don't have a complete skeleton of any of them to measure from the tip of the nose to the tip of the tail. We have partial skeletons, so we have to guess. Um, among the biggest is one from Argentina that was creatively named Argentinosaurus. Um, and so there's, you know, in North America, we have Brachiosaurus and Diplodocus. And, you know, if these things live long enough, dinosaurs kept growing all their lives. Unlike us, we tend to get to a point when we stop growing. Dinosaurs kept growing. They, they slowed down, but they still grew. So if a dinosaur lived long enough, it might grow bigger than all the other dinosaurs. So it is really hard to say which one is the biggest, but you can bet pretty positive sure that it was a, one of those big sauropods. That's a great answer. You take me back to, you know, back when I was little and uh, was asking all sorts of questions about dinosaurs too. So Scott, I'm conscious of time because I know a lot of people join us on Blue Code Talks on their lunch breaks. So we want to make sure that they have time to get ready to go back to work and back to school. So I'm going to turn the floor back to you to see if there's some last things that you wanted to share with our audience, uh, especially inspiring them to get back to nature. Yeah, so... What I would say is if you have kids in your life 
whether you're a parent or a grandparent, a neighbor, um, an uncle, whatever it might be, take some responsibility to help connect them with nature. We are the last generation in the woods. And by that, I mean, we're the last generation that grew up spending time in nature and valuing it. So if we don't connect that next generation to nature, guess what? People aren't gonna bother going outside anymore. Canadians treasure their parks and lands. And it turns out that the decision to keep those places um, natural are made by every generation. So if we wanna make sure that those parks are there generations from now for our grandkids to enjoy, we better start taking care of them now and connecting kids with nature is the best way to do that. Those are awesome parting words, Scott. I appreciate it. And I hope, I hope everybody around the, the table today has been inspired to get back out into nature and to rewild and, and be part of the movement to regenerate you know, in a much bigger way than we've ever thought of. So Scott, thank you for joining us. It was so great to have you all the way from San Francisco, but a fellow Canadian and a science champion. And we wish you all the best and have a wonderful summer out in the wild with your kids and family. Thank you. And Julie, it is always a pleasure to see you. You take care out there. And thank you to the, all the people that were listening in today. Appreciate you taking the time. Thanks, Scott. Happy Friday. Take care, everyone. Hey. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.